2 Kings, and most of them are great slice of life kind of uh, stories or events that we can go through as we look at the Word of God. And in this particular one, we see the story of Naaman, who was healed of leprosy. And we can draw some parallels here of Naaman because we can see how Naaman being cured of leprosy is also a picture of how the salvation takes place in our lives and how people come to know who the Lord is. And so we uh, want to take a little bit of time to look at the account of Naaman and then parallel that to this is just what God does in the saving of people from their sins. And so what we want to do is look at the story from A to Z and sort of break it down in different parts and, and figure out how God brings him from a pagan military leader to a believer in the living God. So let's look first at his commission. He was a, a very important man. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. So we look at his position. He's commander of the army, and, and he's, he's, he's the top commander. He's a five-star general in our terms today. And he was a, extremely popular because he had won military battles. He's popular with his king because the king knows he has uh, been the one who led the country to victory. The nation of Syria at that time uh, had been under the oppression of the Assyrians, and uh, Naaman is the general that helps lead the battle that sets him free to independence. And so he becomes a very famous uh, individual, much like we would think of uh, George Washington and the revolution, or in my day, Dwight Eisenhower. I was trying to see how many in the congregation remember uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, but I was about eight years old when I was uh, going around telling everybody to vote for Dwight. And uh, so I was already moving in the political scene. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember how popular he was. He was a World War II hero, uh, five-star general uh, in the United States, supreme commander of the Allied uh, forces in Europe. And he had done very well, and so he was encouraged to run for president, and, and uh, he did. He had an opponent, Adlai Stevenson, who did not do so well because uh, he was handily defeated in the first time he ran for president, and then when he ran for re-election, he defeated him even worse. So it was a tremendous victory. But why was he so popular? Not necessarily because he was such an astute president but because he was such a wonderful war hero that the nation rallied behind him. And this is the kind of guy that Naaman was. Everybody knew he was the general that led the nation to victory. He was a extremely, extremely popular. But something else needs to be seen in the text. If you notice the text that we read, it said that he won the battle because the Lord was with him. Now here's a pagan king who doesn't know God. He may have heard of the God of Israel, but doesn't know anything about him. And yet in the divine scripture, it says by God's providential hand, this nation won a victory because the Lord was with Naaman. And that's an interesting thing, that the Lord had led them to uh, victory. And so what we see behind the scenes, and this is happening all the time behind the scenes. We need to understand this. God's providential hand, and we'll be looking at this more closely in another week, is moving behind the scenes. Sometimes people say, I don't know why that happened, but I assure you that God does, and he's always operating behind the scenes. And here he is operating in this pagan land with this pagan general, and he gives them victory, but I think he's leading them to something even greater. So we look at his commission, but then you want to look at his condition his condition. Now, offhand, most of us would have traded places with him. He was wealthy. He was a hero. He had servants. He was, he, he was highly respected by everybody. 
And we would say, wow, I would like a life like that. But I want you to notice what else it says in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor. Now notice this. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, he was a mighty man of valor. Here's that little word, but, but he was a leper. He had a dreadful disease. Now I'm not so sure we want to trade places with him. He has everything that a person could want on earth but one thing. Have you ever heard the saying, if you have your health, you have everything. Here's a man who has everything except his health. And so he's a leper. Now what is leprosy in the Bible? Leprosy in the Bible, of course, was a very terrible disease, but it was a picture of sin. And, and so when you read about leprosy in the Bible, it's often a type or a picture of what sin is or the effects of sin. And it starts very small. You get a little red mark. In fact, Leviticus 13, 2 says, when a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease. So all this is a little swelling. Oh, what's that? But then it begins to spread, and it becomes a disease. And so he says, a leprous disease on the skin and on the body. And so what happens then? Then that leprous man is responsible in the Jewish law to take certain precautions. Now, this is a pagan uh, ruler. This is a pagan leader. He probably is not familiar with the Jewish laws, but I would suspect that the medical people of his day had some rules about leprosy just as the Jews did. In the Jewish case, Leviticus 13.45, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear clothes, wear torn clothes, in other words, he's supposed to make himself look ragged, and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry, unclean! If anybody goes to come near him, unclean! And that's a picture of sin. But can you imagine living a life like that, where your brother couldn't hug you, your mother couldn't hug you, your wife didn't want to hug you? Unclean. And that's a picture of sin in the life of people. And that's what the leprosy pictured, and this is the kind of life that they had. And, and it, was, it was a terrible thing. They had to live outside of the camp and they were not able to have those relationships that would be so meaningful, but they're not able to now. Leviticus 13, 46, he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And so leprosy was a terrible disease of the day, and it pictured sin. Sin separates us from God. We're not in a relationship with God. And that's the picture we get as we look at leprosy. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Before you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible describes us as dead. It describes us as wicked. It describes us as sick. And leprosy pictures all those things that are described from a spiritual aspect concerning people who do not know the Lord. And one of the saddest elements of leprosy was isolation. It was a very, very sad thing. And, and of course, there was other issues with leprosy. For instance, the loss of feeling. When you became a leopard, your body would begin to have its nerves break down, and you would lose feeling. You would begin to have no pain. Now, how many times I've heard people in life say something like this, I wish I didn't have any pain. Have you ever felt that or said that? Well, to a degree, that's great. But if you lose pain as a, in your limbs or in, in your arms and your legs, if you lose pain in those parts of your body, you're in great jeopardy. And that's what happens to leopards. Have you ever seen pictures of leopards missing arms and, and, or hands or legs? And you say, did the disease take that off? And the answer is no, the disease didn't take that off, but the disease resulted in that problem. Because what happens is they can no longer feel pain. And they could actually walk over without thinking about it. They could put their hand on a hot stove and not know it was there. And their hand could burn 
and completely, and, and, or they could, they could cut their hand with a saw, and they wouldn't know it because they didn't feel the pain. Sometimes we think pain is such a bad thing, but I tell you, without pain, we couldn't survive. And the leopard loses the sense of pain, and then he loses limbs. And so it's a picture of a broken humanity. It's the worst picture you can draw, and it's really a picture of a type of sinners, what a sinner is like before they come to know the Lord. So we look at his commission and his condition. Now his chance. He's a leper, and he wants to get healed. Of course, there was very little healing of that particular situation, but there is a chance. And so God gave Naaman victory. That's his providential hand. But his providential hand moves in his life in another way to extend grace to him in a very beautiful way. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2, now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And so in God's divine providence, this little girl, to the home of Naaman to take care of the needs of his wife, and she is now captured, taken away from her homeland. Now let me just think again in terms of God's providence. How do you think the parents felt? Their little girl has been kidnapped by people from another country. She has been taken, in effect, to be a slave. The parents, I'm sure, felt extremely, extremely bad, very sad about this whole thing. But what they don't know is that God is going to use this little girl in a wonderful way. Sometimes we don't see what God is doing behind the scenes. We only see the tragedy of the moment, but we don't see that God is moving behind the scenes and is doing something to bring glory to himself. And this little girl, this little servant girl, is now in the hands of the wife of this famous general. And what she does is she brings God into the whole situation. She speaks up for God. Now, I find that very interesting because it says she was a little girl, and she's in a foreign country. She's under a rulership of all idol worshipers, pagan people, who worship idols, her master is sick, and she speaks up and tells them about the prophet in Israel. Now let me ask you a question. Do you find it hard to speak of Jesus in the workplace? Do you find it hard to speak when you meet a friend and you're having a chat and you know they need the Lord, and yet you find it hard? And yet here is a little girl. She often strikes me in my heart. This little girl said a word for God. How powerful it is when you and I are willing to speak a word for God. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 3, She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now I can only say she had to be an amazingly convincing little girl. She is a servant girl, and, and she's saying to her master's wife, I know how your husband can get cured. Now, what do you think it would cost her if they didn't believe her? It would have been a very sad situation. And yet she is bold because she believes in her heart that God can do it through the prophet that is in Israel, and she is a very convincing person. It's amazing because you see here is this strong Gentile leader, and here is this hated Jew because the Gentiles hated the Jew. Here is this great, powerful man. Here's this little maid. Here's the captain, and she's the captive, and here is a leper, but she's whole. And here's one who worships idols, and she worships the living God, and she's willing to speak up for God. So she mentions what God could do if only, if only he could bump, get to the prophet in Samaria. And so she, at that moment, is braver than the general as she speaks a word for the living God. Now, I wonder if we're that bold and if we're that convincing. But obviously, Naaman heard, and he had enough faith. He was so convinced when his wife said, do you know what this girl said to me? And, and I'm sure he might have gone in and questioned her. What did you say? I said, if you could only get to the prophet of the living God, you could be healed. And Naaman is listening and listening, and he's convinced. He's so convinced that he goes and he talks to the king. He operates on that because he's convinced. Now, let me say something. 
if you and I have the purpose of sharing the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the passion and the desire of our heart, people will believe us. If we're not ashamed or in a sheepishly way share Christ, but rather we're bold and we're unashamed of the gospel, I've adopted a personal life statement that helps me get over those times of difficulty. When I'm sitting somewhere and, and I sense that God is saying, open your mouth. And you've all been there if you've served the Lord for any length of time where you know you should say something, and yet because of the circumstance we're afraid of being rebuked or we're afraid of being laughed at or we're afraid of getting a, a rough treatment, we're silent. So my purpose is to encourage people in the hope of Jesus Christ and to give them the tools to see that hope fulfilled. And so when I'm sitting next to somebody, I am energized by the fact that I am on this earth with a reason and a purpose of serving the living God and speaking about him. Our church has a purpose too. And if you embrace that purpose, you will find that you will be more bold in sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our purpose as a church is to lead people into a loving and mature relationship with Jesus Christ and then to equip and inspire them to do the same. And so we're, we're desirous of telling people about a Savior. And I hope you are too because I know sometimes we're in that place where we're with the generals and they're powerful and we're afraid to speak. But you would be surprised. Here's a little handmaid that changes the destiny of a person because she simply said, if only he could get to the prophet. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 4, Naaman went in and told his Lord. He's going into the king now. He's filled with enthusiasm. He has hope. Something's happening. And he says, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And he's convincing enough that the king, who loves this man because of what he is and what he's done, the king is willing to invest and send him on his way. So in verse 5, the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Now I want you to notice the first error that was made here. He said, I will send you to the king of Israel. Where did the girl tell him to go? To the prophet. Listen, so often we think it's the government that will solve our problems. Isn't that the way we think? Just let the government, go, the go to the government, they'll fix your problem. Listen, what the government can never fix is a heart that needs Jesus. Only the word of God can do that. And so people are sent to the government to get this fixed and get this fixed from the government. It doesn't work. And here's the next thing the king thought. If he puts enough money into it, it'll get fixed. No. Here's what I found out. When you put more money into something that's a problem, the problem doesn't get fixed, but the money gets spent. That's what happens. And so the king is thinking like a king. He's not thinking like a spiritual person. He's thinking like a king, and he sends him on his way with all this money to go visit the king of Israel. And it reminds me of the woman in the book of Mark who spent all her money trying to get a cure, and she found that cure when she met Jesus. And that's how life is. And so he's on his way to go meet the king of Israel. And chapter 5, verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. Now, let's just imagine the king gets this letter, and he's looking at it, and he sees this leprous man, and he's got this letter from this other king, says, Cure my servant. And the king knows he can't do a thing. And so what does he do? Verse 7, And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God? What does this guy expect of me? Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? And then he says, I know what he's up to. He's looking for a reason for a quarrel. He's looking for a reason to have a conflict between his nation and mine. And so he thinks that the king is setting him up for a fight. But in reality, the king just doesn't know who to send them to. He thinks prophet and king are pretty much the same, and he doesn't know the difference. So obviously, the king is in distress. Now, I don't know how word got to Elisha, but it got to him pretty quick, it seems. It says, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, he is um, 
he is saying to the king, you need some faith. You need to understand there's a prophet in Israel. And you know, that's been the great battle through the first book of Kings and the second book of Kings. The kings are running their lives their way instead of putting trust and faith in the living God. And now God is not only going to teach Naaman the power of God, but he's also going to teach that king again that there is a prophet in Israel. Now he's come to a point of choice. Here's the point of choice. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots. Now, you see this great entourage of horses and chariot and, and footmen and servants standing there in front of the house of Elisha. They stood at the door of Elisha. Now, if someone knocked on my door and I saw this whole parade of people out there coming to seek me, I might get excited. On the other hand, I might think it was the police coming to take me away. But it's a great crowd out there. And so he knocks on the door, and Elisha sends a messenger to him saying, Go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Elisha doesn't even go out and meet him. What? This is an important character. This is a big man. But Elisha doesn't go out because he knows the issue. The issue isn't me shaking hands with Naaman. The issue is demonstrating the power and the glory of God. And Elisha just sends him a note. Go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. See you later. Now Naaman's a little uptight about this. He, he has showed up at the house with all this wealth and power. How impressive. And the prophet's not impressed. Just go dip yourself in the Jordan. So it says in verse 11, Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to meet me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the lepers. Oh, I thought he would go, Who are you cured? Everybody likes a show. And so we want to show. And, and so, many, so many churches are into showing today. In the name of Jesus, poof. Let's just show the power of God in lives changed and conversion and people having a different life. And Naaman thought for sure something spectacular was going to take place. It would if he listened to the prophet. But he's expecting this big showmanship stuff. Now, and what happens is pride slips in. Don't you know I'm somebody? I'm Naaman. You don't even come out and open the door? And you tell me to go dip in the Jordan River? What is this? And you see, he's, it says that, verse 11, Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out. I'm angry. Surely he would come out. Oh, Naaman, Naaman, so good to meet you. But he doesn't. He just leaves them hanging and tells them what to do. You see, pride often interferes with salvation. When we tell folks you need a Savior, one of the things we need to tell them in that process is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we're telling them they're what? They're sinners. They're lost. They're alienated from God. They're in trouble. And we're saying, you're a sinner. And now the first thing they say, who do you think you are to tell me I'm a sinner? And now pride is kicking in. And the answer is, everyone's a sinner. And, 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 and Naaman's used to respectful talk. But saying you're a sinner doesn't go over too well with a lot of people. But that's what he needs to know. And he, and he came with all the expectations and they weren't met. Now he's filled with anger and wrath. And he's walk, taking a walk. He wanted a sign, not a mere word. Then something else kicks in. National pride. <laughs> Are you telling me to dip in the Jordan? What kind of river is the Jordan? Now I can tell you what kind of the river it is because I've gone in it a few times. I've held baptismal services in the Jordan and I want to tell you, it's a dirty river. You walk in the Jordan, it's not like crystal clear water. You can't even see an inch down in the water. And, you, and, and it's moving quick, and then little muskrats swim around while you're baptizing. Praise Jesus, I baptize you in the name. 
That's a muskrat, yeah. I mean, I'm not wanting to go in the Jordan. And neither is Naaman. And he says, are not Abana and Parfur, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Yes, they're cleaner, they're nicer looking. Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and went away in a rage. And what he's saying in effect is, our God's as good as your God, our life is as good as your life, my town's better than your town. And, and some people say, well, why do I have to believe in your God? And the answer is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. And it's not me being proud about something. I had to do it the same way you did. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. And that's the, that's the bottom line. And so he walks around. He's, he's just angry as can be, and he's in a rage. But I want you to notice something. In the midst of his rage, he gets some good advice. Thank God for people who can calm some of those folks down who get off the handle. And here he is in 2 Kings 5.13. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? And what he's saying is this, Naaman, are you listening? Did you hear what he said? Here's what he said. He said, you're going to get cured. You're going to get whole if you do what he says. They go on to say, he has actually said to you, wash and be clean. Isn't that what you wanted? Wash and be clean. He actually said that to you. Naaman, why are you so uptight? Get rid of your pride, man. Wash and be clean. Think about it. Can a sinner actually be made clean? And the Bible says yes. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you wash and you're clean. And you have a new life. And he's saying, he said to you, did you hear the prophet? Wash and be clean. What do you care if it's in the Jordan or if it's in Samaria? Where? What do you? Or Syria? What do you care? Do you want to be clean? And Naaman thinks about this for a moment, and he realizes the problem was leprosy. That's why he came to Samaria to get cured. That's why he came to meet the prophet, and the only thing. It seems that it's keeping him from the cure right now is his pride. And how many times I've watched pride keep somebody from confessing Christ. I'm not bad. I'm a relatively good person. And they allow that pride to keep them from coming to see their need of a Savior. And when they get rid of all the dignity and they're willing to be stripped of all their self-confidence, that's when they discover that there's a Savior. Well, we watch this guy go from this great leader. Now he's, he's, he's in this leper state. He gets the word from the prophet. He has a choice to make. I will do what he says or I won't. And that's how it is in salvation. I'll do it the way Jesus says, the way the Bible says, or I won't. And now let's look at his chain. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. After his... Men talked to him, and his rage calmed down. He went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. I would love to have been there and see his face on dip six. One, two, three, four. What would have happened if he quit? I mean, here's this well-known general. His whole crowd is standing on the Jordan watching him down down and he stands up each time the same as he is what would happen if he quit on six think about that but then seven and he comes up and he goes like this why well, it says he went seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored. Notice this. 
like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean, like that little girl who worked with his wife, who said, if only you would go see the prophet, you would be healed. And he stands up, and, and you know, I don't know, as you get older, your flesh is not like a little baby. You know what I mean? I mean, I've got calluses and rips and cuts and scars. And then imagine him coming up, and his flesh is like a little child. I mean, that is a wonderful thing. And it's a picture of what takes place inside of us when Jesus Christ becomes our Lord and Savior. We are cleansed wholly and completely and fully. We are freely forgiven and accepted in the Beloved. We become children of the living God. And as he was cleaned on the external, we are cleaned on the internal. And now he's no longer filled with rage. He's filled with thankfulness. He's filled with joy because God has done a miracle. So what does he do? He's thankful. He goes back in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15. He returns to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but Israel. That's funny. An hour before, he was a pagan worshiper. Now he's a believer. God has done something in his life. And he's beginning to put the pieces together, how God had given him victory, and God had put a servant in his house, and he'd heard the word. He responded. He went to the prophet. The prophet told him what to do. When he finally came to his senses, he did it, and God did what the prophet said he would do. And now he's convinced there's only one God. And, of course, there can only be one God because there can only be one sovereign. You can't have two sovereigns. And so... I know that there's no God in all the earth but the God of Israel. And so this is a sign of the redeemed. When you come to an understanding that there is no God but our God, it's not an issue of pride. It's an issue of reality. There's one God in all the earth. And so now he goes back and he, he, he appears to the prophet and he says, I'm going to give you a gift. Now accept a gift from me. But notice what the prophet says. No. In chapter 5, verse 16, he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged them to take it, but the prophet refused. And why did he refuse that gift? And here's the simple reason. The gospel is a free gift. There is no money you can pay for salvation. There is nothing you can do except receive the gift. And there's, and, and, and there's nothing you can do to pay for it, and there's nothing you can do to keep it. By, it has nothing to do with you, except your need. When you cry out to the living God, I need a Savior. And regardless what he offers, no, it has nothing, and and the prophet is teaching him a lesson. No, what you received is a free gift from the living God. And what a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so the prophet won't take the gift. So in verse 17, Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. Why? Notice this. For from now on your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any god but the Lord. Any god but the Lord. See how powerful that is? He says, I'm I'm not going to offer to any god but the Lord. I am changed. Now see, that's the evidence of salvation. A life changed. He says, I am changed. I will not bow down and worship another god. But now, in saying that, he has a dilemma. Remember who he is. He's Naaman. He's right next to the king in the kingdom. He's the king's favorite general. He's with the king wherever the king goes. What is the king? He's a pagan. He worships false gods. He worships idols. Now, Naaman has a problem. Let me share a truth with you. When you come and you ask Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, you still have to go to work on Monday. Did you know that? That same cantankerous boss that was cantankerous on Friday will show up on Monday. He'll still be there. If you have problems with some people in your life, they're not all going to drop dead and disappear. They're going to be there. You're going to still have struggles in life because we live in a broken and a fallen world. 
And when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you're changed, but the whole world hasn't changed. And so you have to live in this broken and fallen world. And all of a sudden, Naaman understands something. He is going back to a pagan nation, to a pagan king, as the only believer. Will that affect him? Yeah. So he says to the prophet in 2 Kings 5.18, In this manner may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, I bow, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. What he's saying is I'm bowing on the outside, but I'm not believing on the inside, but I have to do protocol because I'm stuck in this mess right now. And I have to go to work on Monday morning. So what, he, what did the prophet say? Here's what the prophet said. Go in peace. Now, I don't know what happened to Naaman. I don't know if he converted the king. I don't know if he led his wife to believe in the living God. I have a feeling that he led a lot of people to believe in the living God. But it was a process. Because after you accept Christ, what begins in your life is a process. It's a process of change and conformity to the image of Christ. And it doesn't happen overnight or else we'd all be sweet. It's a process. I remember a fellow that I led to, not led to the Lord, but that joined our church when I first started pastor in Illinois. And it was the first guy that joined our church when I pastored there. And, and I got something of his history. He was a alcoholic. And he would drink himself to sleep every night. And one day he's drunk and he turns on the TV and who appears there but Billy Graham. And so in his drunkenness, he's watching Billy Graham. And he watches Billy Graham to the point to that he gets the invitation. And Billy Graham says, if you'd like to receive Jesus, come forward. Well, he can't go forward, forward, but he goes in front of the TV and he gets on his knees. And, he, and he's, Billy, of course, says, pray this prayer. And he prays this prayer. He gets up and he, and he realizes he's just given his heart to the Lord. And then he goes into his room, and he gets rid of all the alcohol, pours it out, never had another drink. I call that salvation. But then he said to me one day, he said, Sal, I don't understand it. He said, I gave up alcohol instantly, but it took me a number of years to give up cigarettes. I just don't get it. He said, uh, why didn't God take those away from me when he took the alcohol away? And I love questions like that. And I, I said to him, well, here's what I think happened. You are destroying your life, your future, and everything around you with the alcohol. That was an issue God wanted to take completely away from you immediately as you became a believer. But then what he wanted you to do is grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He wanted you now to find the things in your life that you thought were displeasing to him and not in line with his will and his goal for your life and then as you discover these truths, to surrender them one by one so that each day you would walk closer to the Lord. You would grow in your grace. You would grow in your Christian walk. You would become a different person in Christ. And day by day, people would see that change occurring in your life, and they would give testimony of the life that you are living. You see, if you accept Jesus today, you walk out with a whole bunch of things that are just like yesterday except one thing different. You're changed. And when you change, then as you grow, other things begin to change. And others around you begin to hear of your love and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Naaman became a changed man, but he went back to a real world, just like every other believer does. And then God began working in him to form in him the image of Christ. And that's what God is doing. If you're a Christian today, God is working in your life to form in you the image of Christ. If you are the same person today that you are five years ago, and you've been a Christian for five years, you're not growing. The Bible tells us to grow in grace, to grow in the knowledge of our Lord. It tells us to mature and put away childish things. That's what we need to do. And God will honor you, and you will demonstrate him wherever you go. Are you a believer today? I hope you are. If not, you have the disease of sin. And that disease is a deadly, deadly disease. And there's only one cure. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer, God wants you to continue to grow. 
to magnify his name in a crooked world that needs a savior. Let's pray together. Father, help us to see how clearly you lay out this picture of a converted individual through Nahum. Nahum. And um, we're so touched. We know how that works in real life. And thank you for that example. May we be as bold as that young servant girl to be a voice for the living God in any circumstance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.